Hello friends, welcome to our latest video. In this episode, we bring you number 16 of our Strangest Unsolved National Park Disappearances series, where we present 10 more cases for you to ponder. Join us. In the United States National Park System alone, there are more than 84 million acres of preserved woods, deserts, mountains, and other wilderness. So it's no surprise that in the past 100 years, there have been a number of cases of reported missing persons. What's most disturbing is these numbers are increasing at an alarming rate, and the circumstances behind these disappearances can sometimes be beyond bizarre. Today, we'll discuss 10 more unsolved National Park disappearances. Please note that some of the cases have very limited information, but we will do our best to keep you updated of any new developments in future update episodes. With that said, sit back, relax, and let's begin. Number 10, Jeannie Heschel-Schwart. Jeannie Heschel-Schwart was a 37-year-old social worker from Arlington, Massachusetts, who had dedicated much of her life to helping others. In July 1995, she and her boyfriend, Mike Monahan, decided to take a well-earned break, which saw them heading to the Yosemite National Park. Unfortunately, this trip would quickly turn into a living nightmare for Mike and Jeannie's family, and while her body was eventually found, we still do not have all the answers in the case. On July 9, 1995, Jenny and Mike hopped into their car and headed to the Yosemite National Park. Driving down highways and turning through intersections and rugged roads finally led them to Glacier Point, which is close to Summit Meadow. With the sun shining and plenty of nature to explore, Mike and Jeannie went their separate ways, walking off in different directions to take a look at whatever they wanted. This arrangement suited the couple, and they had agreed to meet back at their car once they were finished. The walks were only meant to be short, with Mike picking up his binoculars while Jenny set off in a separate direction. Around 15 minutes had passed, and Mike decided that it was time to get back into their car to carry on their journey. As he neared the car, he saw that Jenny wasn't there. He waited at the car, thinking that Jenny would appear at any moment from her short walk, but as minutes turned into hours, there was no sign of Jenny and Mike knew that something was amiss. Panicked, but not yet wanting to alert authorities, Mike searched the area himself, pulling in the help of other hikers and asking those in the area if they had seen his girlfriend. Unfortunately, no one had, and two hours later, Mike approached the Yosemite Park Rangers and alerted them of Jenny's disappearance. This report was taken seriously, and within hours of the report being made, helicopters had descended from the skies and sniffer dogs and their handlers were carefully combing through the park. Mike watched on as search crews and volunteers looked for his girlfriend. By all accounts, the two had shared a happy relationship and had lived in Arlington for several years. Jenny also had a good relationship with her roommate, Vicky Fortino. Her disappearance came as a massive shock to Mike, and the next clue in Jenny's case would only further traumatize him. As mentioned, sniffer dogs were brought in to help track Jenny's scent, and these dogs hit on Jenny's scent almost immediately and circled back around to the road where her car had been parked. The dog handlers had a bizarre reaction to this discovery. Instead of theorizing that perhaps her scent was not strong enough or that other factors were at play, they jumped straight to the idea of foul play. Moreover, they began to point the finger at Mike in the initial hours of the investigation, even though there was no solid evidence whatsoever to prove or disprove this theory. Why the dog handlers jumped immediately to the conclusion of murder is something that we'll never know. But this idea that Mike, or another person possibly, was somehow involved in Jenny's disappearance has persisted to this day, especially with social media sites, internet forums, and other places where armchair web sleuths like to congregate. With the idea and instance from some that foul play was involved in Jenny's disappearance, the park rangers wasted no time in calling the FBI to join the investigation. While park rangers and FBI agents were processing the details, teams on the ground and in the air continued to look for Jenny, and in fact, this search turned into the largest search in Yosemite's history. Search and rescue teams, tracker dogs, volunteers, park rangers, police, FBI, and even paratroop jumpers were all brought in on the search, and despite hundreds of pairs of eyes surveying the land, no sign of Jenny was found in the park. Mike was thoroughly interviewed by the FBI, as were Jeannie's known associates and friends. The FBI was quickly able to rule out Mike after he passed a polygraph test, as we know, however, though, polygraph tests are not an exact science nor an accurate measure of someone's guilt and are not even admissible in some courts across the world for various reasons. 
So, for two weeks, the FBI and other agencies scoured the area in which Jeannie was last seen, and all they found were two footprints that were believed to have been made by Jeannie's boots. One footprint was near the car, and the other, interestingly, was on the trail of Bridal Veil to Yosemite Valley, which is a very popular and well-traveled trail. So, if Jenny had headed down this popular trail, then what happened to her? At the two-week mark, the search was officially called off as the FBI and other agencies failed to find any other evidence that could lead them in the right direction. Jeannie's friends and family were dismayed when the search was called off, but her roommate, Vicki, was determined to keep the search effort alive for her friend. In a brave move, Vicki started her own unofficial search, calling in the help of her friend, Maureen McConnell, and the two set about searching for resources and centers that could help them. They settled on the tracking school run by Tom Brown Jr., and after conversations over the phone, Tom turned the case over to a student of his in California who agreed to help Vicki and Maureen. Tom returned to the area that had once been a buzz with FBI activity and decided to take a different path. In an article for wildwoodtracking.com, they described the route and methodology that the trackers used to find Jenny. The article states, The student called a fellow tracker student who lived near to Yosemite. The student checked out the place where the young woman had disappeared. He found no signs of Jenny, but he did notice that the area consisted of stands of aspen trees. It occurred to him that when the wind blew through the leaves, the resulting noise closely resembled that of a car driving on a paved road. Unfortunately, if one were to search for a road by walking toward the noise, one would be walking away from the true road. The tracker students also studied maps of the area and determined that Jenny would have likely walked somewhere to the right, as riding hand dominance apparently plays a larger role in our decision-making when walking. Despite detailed graphs, maps, and plans being written up and debated, no sign of Jenny was found. The tracking school and those associated agreed that Jenny perhaps went into shock when she noticed she was lost, which would have thrown all rational thoughts out the window. Unofficial searches for Jenny continued, with Vicky and Maureen ever grateful to the efforts of the tracking school and those involved. Trackers continued to scour through different maps and plans of the area, hoping that something would jump out of the page at them. And something did. Using data and techniques learned at the school, they were able to pinpoint a rough and rugged area in the park and even gave investigators the coordinates. However, the investigators were not interested in the least with what these tracking students had to say and quickly dismissed their ideas. Then, on September 3, 1995, Two months after she vanished, Jenny's remains were found by two fishermen in a small body of water. The area in which Jenny was eventually found is three-quarters of a mile above Bridalvale Falls and around three miles from where Jenny was last seen. The fishermen who found Jenny later told investigators, the area is accessible to anyone other than rock and mountain climbers. It's really rugged. So, this begs the question, how did Jenny end up there, and what had happened to her? Due to the advanced level of decomposition, Jenny was identified via dental records, and unfortunately, the coroner was never able to determine a cause of death, although many believe she may have drowned. It would later transpire that the area the students had pinpointed was indeed the area in which Jenny was found. But now that she had been found, the discovery of her remains left investigators with even more questions. Investigators don't believe that Jenny was carried to the area, but they are unable to provide any other theories as to what may have happened to her. Perhaps Jenny went into shock and tried to cross onto a trail in that rugged area, or did something more sinister happen to her? For almost 27 years now, Jenny's case has remained unsolved, and it's high time that her friends and family get the answers and justice they deserve. If you have any information about Jenny or her disappearance, you're asked to contact the FBI's San Francisco field office at 415 415- 553-7400. Number 9. Carol Turner 32-year-old Carol Turner was a postgraduate student at the University of New Mexico and loved nothing more than exploring the great outdoors. When she wasn't studying hard for her degree, Carol would often wander into national parks and open areas to get a look at the plants and wildlife around her. Unfortunately, the trip she made to the Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in January of 1971 would be her last, and ever since then, her disappearance has remained a mystery. On January 31, 1971, Carol drove to the Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in Arizona. 
Carol had a keen interest in plants and flowers, and the monument was the perfect place for Carol, as it is home to many species of wild plants and is the only place in the U.S. where the organ pipe cacti grow. As February crept in, Carol was still in the park, and the last confirmed sighting of her came on February 2, 1971. Park ranger recalled speaking to Carol as she had asked them for hiking suggestions and also told them that she was staying in the main visitor campground of the park. Sadly, there is very little information available about Carol's disappearance, and all we do know is that sometime on February 1st or 2nd, Carol hiked up to Bull Pasture in the Ajo Mountains and that she made that trip again on February 3rd. Unfortunately, Carol never returned from what should have been a day hike, and her absence was noticed immediately. Her car was still parked in the Bull Pasture Trailhead parking lot, and the only thing missing were her boots and canteen. Park rangers immediately recognized the car and its owner. After all, she had spoken to them just a day earlier, asking them for hiking recommendations. Tucked neatly under the windshield wiper of the car was a handwritten note from Carol, giving the park rangers very specific instructions. This note, in context with Carol's disappearance, is certainly chilling and makes you wonder whether Carol maybe had a premonition of what was going to happen to her. The note read to the effect, If my car is still here by February 4th, call Park Rangers. I am a solo hiker. With her sudden disappearance in this ominous note, Park Rangers wasted no time in reporting Carol missing, and soon, authorities had descended on the area. A wide-scale search was carried out for Carol, but no sign of her has ever been found. Over 3,600 hours were put into the investigation, but it remained fruitless. Volunteers, search and rescue personnel, sheriffs, investigators, and other experts, totaling 64 people, all joined in the search for Carol, but were unable to locate any clues. Carlton Oglesby, the sheriff's lieutenant at the time, told the Ajo Copper News on February 11, 1971, everybody, the Monument people, our people, Border Patrol, the Cells Law and Order, has worn themselves out looking for this woman. They're all experienced, and they've gone over the whole place with a fine-tooth comb. None of them see how she could have been missed if she's in there. While Carol has not been found, investigators did discover some baffling entries on the trail registers across the park. At the trail log for Bull Pasture, Carol had cryptically written, Hi, if you have binox, meaning binoculars, look for a white shirt or yellow windbreaker across the way and say hello. The other entry read, I brought the beer. Where were you? This now begs the question, who was Carol waiting for? Who had she brought the beers for? And why were they meeting on the Bull Pasture Trail? 2022 marks the 51st anniversary of Carol's disappearance, and we are sadly no closer now than we were in 1971 in solving this mystery. In fact, there is an underwhelming lack of information in Carol's case, and she has not been listed with NamUs or other authorities. Anyone with any information, no matter how small or insignificant it may seem, is asked to contact the Oregon Pipe Cactus National Park Rangers at 520-387-6849. Number 8. David Barkley Miller From an early age, David Barkley Miller was a force to be reckoned with. The Washington Post article states, David Miller's parents no more could have kept him out of the wilderness than a fish could be kept out of water or a bird from flight. It's clear that David loved the great outdoors, and this love affair of his with nature would ultimately cost him his life. After graduating from college with a degree in religious studies, David decided that his job needed to be an adventurous one. He wasn't the kind of person to sit behind a desk all day. He wanted to get out into the world and experience as much of it as possible. When the phone rang in early 1998, David was over the moon to hear that it was the Sedona U.S. Forest Service offering him a job as a park ranger in the Coconino National Forest. David took the job and was incredibly eager to get started. His family was incredibly proud of him, and it was clear that he had a long and happy career ahead of him. Unfortunately, the promise of a bright future would come to an end on May 19, 1998. On that day, David told his colleagues that he was going for a two-and-a-half-day hike in the Red Rock Secret Mountain Wilderness area in the Coconino National Forest where he worked. David was considered a very experienced hiker, and there were no concerns for his safety as he knew the park well. On that same day, his fellow park rangers saw David at the Beaver Creek Ranger Station, 
but this was the last time that David Miller was ever seen or heard from. When he failed to return from his trip and returned to work, his colleagues raised the alarm and the search began. The search intensified after David's car was discovered abandoned at the Bolte Arch Trail, but no sign of him has ever been found. As said previously, David was extremely experienced in the wilderness, and authorities believe that he most likely got injured or fell during his hike. With the anniversary of his disappearance fast approaching, his family and friends hope that 2022 will be the year that they finally receive answers. David Barkley Miller is described as a white male with sandy blonde hair, blue-gray eyes, stands at 5 foot 11 inches tall and weighs 160 pounds. He was last seen wearing a t-shirt, shorts, black hiking boots, and was carrying a forest green Gregory backpack. Anyone with any information is asked to contact the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office at 928-771-3260 and reference case number 98-14554. Number 7. Michael Bryson 27-year-old Michael Bryson was the love of his parents' lives. He was a constant source of joy and happiness for those around him, and despite having his own issues with substance abuse, Michael wanted to help everyone. Anna Brandt, one of Michael's friends, told the spokesman newspaper he was really a good guy. He would give the shirt off his back to a stranger, and he had the most infectious smile and laugh that would light up any room he walked into. He was vulnerable, but in the best way. He opened up to people in a way that made them comfortable to be their true selves around him. In August 2020, Michael was starting to turn his life around. He had struggled with substance abuse and addiction, but was making conscious efforts to get his life back on the right track. August 3rd, some sources state the 4th, 2020 would be the last time that Michael's parents, Parrish and Tina, would ever see their son alive. According to reports, Michael stopped by their house in Harrisburg, Oregon to see them, and all appeared well. During this meeting, Michael told his parents that he was on his way to Hobo Campground in the Umpqua National Forest and that he would be gone for around a week. Tina, Parrish, and other friends would later tell investigators that Michael and a group of friends were heading to Hobo Camp for a birthday celebration slash camping trip. Those at the event, however, described it later as more of a rave and that on the night of August 4th, 2020, between 40 and 60 people were in attendance. The party kicked off on the night of the 4th with friends gathering around and enjoying themselves. The party continued well into the morning of August 5th, and at around 4.30 a.m., witnesses recall seeing Michael get out of a party bus and walk away from the camp. This is the last confirmed sighting of Michael, and since then, he's not been seen or heard from. His father, Parrish, told NBC News, We know he was up there Monday and Tuesday, and that the DJ at this party, that was actually a rave, invited him up on stage to do a set, but by the next morning, he was gone. As his friends awoke the next morning, no doubt with pounding heads and hazy memories from the night before, they noticed that Michael was missing. All his camping equipment had been left in his friend's car, and his phone had been turned off ever since they entered the hobo campground. According to his mother, Tina, who was only alerted to her son's disappearance on August 6, 2020, by the time we found out, it was almost 12 hours since he'd been missing. The moment I put my foot out of the car, I knew Michael was gone. People weren't looking for Michael. They were sitting around, drinking, eating, laughing. Nobody was out searching for him, so I felt in my gut something had happened. Michael's father, Parrish, also added, There's been a lot of conflicting stories from the beginning. One story is that he walked away from the camp. The other story is that a group of individuals picked him up on the road. It appears that those at Hobo Campground with Michael dragged their heels in reporting him missing and valuable time was lost on his case. When the alarm was finally raised, the Lane County Sheriff's Office, along with horseback riders, search and rescue teams, boots on the ground, and drones all set about searching for Michael. Unfortunately, after almost 19 days, the search was called off as no trace of Michael was found. To their credit, some of Michael's friends and even strangers who'd attended the party stayed behind to help his family search for him. His family believed that those who attended the party hold the key to what happened to Michael that night, and it will take the right person to talk for answers and justice to be served. While investigators called off official searches, 
His family and friends continue to search Hobo Campground multiple times a week for him. Facebook pages, groups, posters, and flyers were created and circulated in the area. Michael's family fought to keep his name in the media spotlight, hoping that his picture might jog someone's memory. His family continued and continues to this day to advocate for Michael as at the forefront of the search for him. The Facebook group, Let's Find Michael Bryson, has over 22,000 members who are dedicated to helping the family look for him. The group is littered with posts from friends, family, and strangers who are all pulling their tips and information together in a safe haven. The fight to keep Michael's case in the media paid off when, in December 2020, five months after he disappeared, a new tip came into investigators. According to the spokesman, the Lane County Sheriff's Office received a tip that led them to Bryce Creek Road, just a short distance from the Hobo Campground area. During a search of this area, the Sheriff's Office discovered items of Michael's clothing that he had been wearing on the night he disappeared. Parrish later told KPIC News, the blue ribbon is right there where two of the items were found, and the blue and orange ribbon is where the other items were found. I'm 99% sure these items were planted. He also added, we have a really good idea of what's happened, some idea as to who's involved, and we're just waiting on that last tip to open everything up. We just want the truth. We want Michael back. 2022 will mark two years since Michael mysteriously vanished from the hobo camp in Nompqua National Forest, but his family have not given up on their search for him. His parents regularly drive down the roads and through the area where he was last seen. They continue to update the Facebook group have also created the Michael Bryson Foundation, which aims to address the needs of any family searching for a missing loved one. Michael Bryson is described as a white male with brown hair, blue eyes, although other agencies report green or hazel. He stands six foot tall and weighs 150 pounds. Michael has facial hair, a nose ring, and several tattoos. Tattoos include hands shaking in the shape of a heart with Stay Strong My Brothers in cursive writing on his ribcage, a geometric-shaped bear on the back of his arm, an elephant on his right leg, a tree in a diamond shape on the lower left front leg, and a lion face on his left leg. He was last seen wearing a white t-shirt, tan short, and white Crocs with rainbows on them. NBC News also added that he may be wearing a brown corduroy baseball cap. Currently, there's a $10,000 reward in this case, and anyone with any information is asked to contact the Lane County Sheriff's Office at 541-682-4150 and reference case 20-5286. Number 6. Fern Baird 63-year-old Fern Baird was a successful and well-accomplished woman living in Park City, Utah. Fern had made a comfortable life for herself working as a realtor and owning her own yoga bag business. Her cousin described her as an outdoorsy woman who loved to ski and took life at a slower pace sometimes. On October 19, 2020, Byrne made a trip to the Sawtooth National Forest in Idaho and set out for what should have been a simple day hike. However, Byrne failed to return home and since October 19, 2020, there's been no sign of Fern and she remains missing. At around 1 p.m. on October 19, 2020, Fern signed into the Prairie Creek Trailhead in the Prairie Peak area of the Sawtooth National Forest. Fern would never sign out, and what happened to her is a mystery. Upon checking the trail logs, investigators discovered that a group of five hikers also entered the trail around the same time as Fern, but they have never been able to track these people down. In her entry, Fern wrote to the lake and back, and the Charlie Project reports that the Prairie Creek Trail is a 10-mile loop along the west side of Highway 75 within the boundaries of the National Park. Nobody noticed that Fern was missing or potentially in danger until October 22nd of 2020, when the hotel she had been staying at alerted the authorities. Fern had not checked out of her room, and she had not been seen since she left for a hike on October 19th. The Blaine County Sheriff's Office and the Blaine County Sheriff's Search and Rescue Team responded to the incident and began their search for Fern. As the investigation continued, the Idaho Mountain Search and Rescue, National Guard helicopters, drones, ATVs, horse riders, and three dog units were also brought in to help with the search. 
Ultimately, nothing would be found, and days after she'd been reported missing, the search was officially called off. There's only been one clue in Fern's disappearance, and that was the discovery of her 2018 Subaru Crosstrek in the Prairie Creek parking area. Apart from that, there's been no credit card activity, no phone activity, and no clue to suggest where she may have headed or where she ended up. Possible that Fern had either hiked to the Prairie Lakes, Minor Lakes, Norton Lakes, or Mill Lake, and all these areas have been searched extensively. In a press conference shortly after Fern's disappearance, Lane County Sheriff Steve Harkins said, We are interested in speaking with an unknown Boise couple, and also a party of five hikers from Tulsa, Oklahoma, that both hiked either the West Fork drainage of Prairie Creek or to Prairie Lake on October 19th. These individuals may have information, or maybe they saw Baird hiking that day. Two years later, and the Blaine County Sheriff's Office are still searching for the individuals mentioned in their initial press release. The prevailing theory is that Fern got injured and perished while out in the wilderness. Chief Deputy William Fruling of the Blaine County Sheriff's Office told the Inquisitor, The most likely theory is that she became lost, perhaps left the trail, and had to spend the night. She may have taken shelter and passed away from exposure. There's nothing that points to foul play, but there's nothing that points to anything concrete either. Fern Baird remains missing and her case remains unsolved. Her friends and family have never given up looking for her and have posted a $25,000 reward for information that leads to her whereabouts. Fern is described as a white female with brown, graying hair, brown eyes, she stands 5 foot 5 inches tall and weighs 115 pounds. Fern was last seen wearing a light gray jacket, dark pants, gray gloves, a dark mask, and a dark fanny pack. Anyone with any information is asked to please contact Lieutenant Micah Bade with the Blaine County Sheriff's Office at 208-788-5555 and reference case BCS 2010-006. Number 5. Lucas Renault On June 18, 2018, 20-year-old Lucas Renault called his mother, Magali, wishing her a happy birthday. Magali now cherishes this call, as this is the last time she ever spoke to her son. According to Le Parisien, Lucas, a student at the Chauteneuve Polo Park, along with 10 other people, planned to hike to the Harrison Waterfalls close to the border of France and Switzerland. This is an extremely popular destination, and from reports, it appears that hundreds of people make the trip to the waterfalls each year. As the group began to walk down the steps to the waterfall, a friend snapped a quick photo of Lucas, holding the dog of one of the hikers in his arms. This would be the last photo ever taken of Lucas, and just hours later, their trip would descend into panic and chaos. Lucas never returned from his walk to the waterfall, and his absence was noted immediately by his friends. It appears that the group had become separated during the walk, but the full details of this have never been disclosed. Aside from the call to his mother, Lucas made one other call on the day of his disappearance. According to the newspaper, a little later, he would have lost his walking comrades in circumstances that remain to be clarified. Around 10.20 p.m., Lucas dials 112, the European emergency number, explaining to the call handler that he is tired of wandering in the woods and his legs are starting to hurt. This article further states that the call lasted for around eight minutes before it was abruptly cut off. With this worrying call and his friends noticing his absence, a search was quickly underway for Lucas. Helicopters fitted with thermal imaging cameras ascended to the skies, and search and rescue teams, along with volunteers, set out into the wilderness to find Lucas. As the days went on, as many as 90 people joined in the search for Lucas, but they found no trace of him. His friends and family appealed to the media for anyone with information to come forward and could do nothing but watch as the search continued. Just one and a half days after Lucas disappeared, the search was called off, much to the disappointment of his family. The police began interviewing everyone present, but nobody was able to provide them with any solid clues. Lucas' father spoke to France Blue, telling them the police combed the area on Wednesday and Thursday morning, but afterwards, we did not see them anymore. We, with our friends, our family, volunteers of the sector, we then searched for a week, every day, in vain. We were just shown a map of what had been done, as if to say, now, manage. It was a walker who alerted to a suspicious smell on June 26th. 
The police first believed in a runaway, and then I think if Lucas had been a minor, the search would have been longer, better organized. The Dog Association had offered to help us. The police refused. I don't understand. We should have pulled all our forces to find him. We might have been able to save him. On June 26, 2018, the world came to a standstill for the Renaults when a fellow hiker found Lucas' body slumped against a tree, less than 2,000 feet from the waterfall's parking lot. The coroner was called to the scene, and he determined that Lucas' body was severely decomposed and that an autopsy would likely not yield any results. Positive identification was made through clothing and DNA, and the Renault family began their grieving process. Due to the level of decomposition, the coroner was not able to determine a time or cause of death, but ruled out any serious injury. A toxicology test was also run with the results detecting the presence of drug molecules corresponding to a treatment prescribed to Lucas, but within the limits of therapeutic dosage. This, therefore, made it impossible to evaluate the thesis of intoxication. His family, understandably, were incredibly displeased with the investigation into their son's disappearance and eventual passing. His mother gave an interview to France Blue, telling them, The police made me listen to the call so that I could identify my son's voice. I was upset. I did not have the force to listen to everything. In the recording, Lucas' call handler does not give him advice, does not ask him the right questions. Instead of telling him not to move, he asks him to try to find a way out and then it cuts off. Unfortunately, it seems that there is no resolution for Lucas' family. Due to the level of decomposition, his family were not allowed to view him before the burial as his body was, quote, too damaged. Lucas was laid to rest, and now his family are fighting for answers and justice. His family sent letters to the authorities in France, but it appears that those letters were ignored, leading them to file a complaint via lawyer. His mother is also accused a public prosecutor of withholding the autopsy report from them and other information. Anyone with any information is urged to contact the French police at 0800-004712 or 03-84-35-8600. Number 4. Jeff Haig 16-year-old Jeff Haig of Morristown, Tennessee, along with two other boys, Lee Smith and Stephen Wolf, went on a hike into the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, led by their scout leader, Eugene Smith, and assistant scout leader, Marvin Horner. There was also an additional chaperone, Reverend Pister Lyons, in February 1970. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information about Jeff other than that he lived with his mother, father, and three siblings in Morristown, and that he attended New Concord School. Jeff, along with other boys his age, were involved in Troop 95 of the Explorer Scouts, whose mission was to get young people into the great outdoors and teach them valuable survival skills as well as life lessons along the way. On February 7, 1970, the troop entered the park and made their way through, looking for a suitable place to set up camp for the night. By the next morning, the troop and its leaders were ready to return home. With equipment and the boys in tow, the leaders began retracing their steps and making their way back to the parking lot. While they started with three boys, they ended up leaving the park with just two. According to reports, while they were making the return hike, Jeff stopped at the junction of the Appalachian Trail and Boulevard Trail for a rest. He also planned on waiting for Lee Smith, one of his fellow troop members, who had been following the group at his own pace. Eugene, the troop leader, okayed this decision, and the group agreed to meet back at the parking lot in half an hour or so. Thirty agonizing minutes passed before Lee Smith emerged from the park and into the parking lot, but there was no sign of Jeff. Lee said he hadn't seen Jeff on the trail, and it was then that the leaders knew that Jeff was likely in danger. A large search party was organized, and hundreds of volunteers quickly poured in to find the missing teen. The searchers were joined by sniffer dogs, and the groups carefully combed through the park and the trail junctions for 10 days. Unfortunately, their efforts were hindered when snow began to fall and temperatures plummeted. When the conditions cleared, a horrifying discovery was made. Jeff's body was found, frozen, with his socks removed, one boot missing, and his pants pulled down. To add to the mystery, his hiking bag and equipment were found a thousand feet away in a river, the contents strewn and scattered about as if someone had been looking for something. The coroner ruled that Jeff had succumbed to exposure, but that didn't explain why articles of clothing were missing or that his pants had been pulled down. 
Is it possible Jeff became hypothermic and was struck by a paradoxical undressing? This phenomenon can make those who are dangerously cold experience a sudden flash of warmth that makes them take their clothes off to cool down. Since his discovery and funeral, Jeff's case has remained a case of exposure. But how did he end up alone and in a position to perish? What caused him to disappear in such a narrow time frame? And why did nobody see or hear anything? Is Jeff's case a simple one of getting lost and succumbing to the elements? Or is there something darker going on in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park? If you recall, this was only about a year after Dennis Martin disappeared in the Great Smoky Mountains Park, never to be found again. Number three, Cullen Finnerty. 30-year-old Cullen Finnerty had a whole host of accolades under his belt. He had played for several NFL teams and was drafted by the Baltimore Ravens in 2007 after an incredibly successful college career. There are simply too many honors and awards to mention here, but there is no doubt that Cullen was an exceptionally talented American football star and that both on and off the field, he was going to go far. In 2010, Cullen married his girlfriend, Jennifer, and the couple welcomed two children into the world, Caden and McKinley, completing their family. To the outside world, the lives of the Finnerty seemed perfect. Cullen was a football star and had a great family life. But one weekend fishing would turn that upside down and leave the sports world with so many questions that remain unanswered. On May 26, 2013, Cullen said goodbye to his wife and two children for what would be the last time. Cullen was dropped off at the Bray Creek State Forest Campground and was headed toward the Baldwin River to do a little bit of fishing. At this time, the Finnerty's were on vacation and Cullen wanted to make the most of his trip before they had to return home. He waved goodbye to his family, telling them that he would see them later when they came to collect him. By 10.30 p.m. that night, a distressing 911 call was made to the local police, telling them that Cullen Finnerty was missing. During the call, his family detailed how they had driven back to the campground to pick him up, but there was no sign of him. His boat was there, but there was no Cullen. This immediately sent alarm bells ringing, and within hours, the Bray Creek State Forest was abuzz with police and search and rescue activity. Investigators began talking to his family and digging into his personal life, desperately trying to uncover any clue, and they found a huge one. On the night of his disappearance, Cullen had made two phone calls, one to his beloved wife, Jennifer, and one to his brother-in-law. In the phone call to his wife, Cullen was distressed and paranoid. Jennifer heard rustling in the background, and when she asked him what it was, he told her that he was taking his clothes off. During the call with his wife, Cullen also called out to the man he believed to be 20 feet behind him. Then, the phone call to his brother-in-law at 9.36 p.m. was the last activity on Cullen's phone. And while the call was only 20 seconds long, it included some chilling details. According to the brother-in-law, Cullen told him, I don't know where I am and also that he had encountered two men on the Baldwin River and that he thought they were following him. According to a New York Times article, this wasn't the first time that Cullen had been overwhelmed by paranoia. As reported by the New York Times, in 2011, Cullen was working in Detroit. Now the blue, he hopped into his car and drove to Grand Rapids to his older brother Tim's house. He told Tim that he had to leave Detroit abruptly because he was being followed. This behavior worried Tim and he told the New York Post that it was the only time he had ever seen his brother genuinely scared to death. The search for Cullen intensified with the Lake County Sheriff's Office, 22 reserve officers, and 100 volunteers joining the search as the days progressed. The search came to a screeching halt on May 28, 2013, however, with the discovery of Cullen's body by his parents, who had joined in with the search. According to reports, Cullen was found lying face down with his arms at his sides, wearing the same clothes he had left in on May 26. His family, friends, and associates were devastated by the news. To them, it made no sense. Cullen had a successful career in medical sales, was an accomplished American football player, and had a steady, happy home life with a wife and kids. Why would he wander into the woods? And why did he believe he was being followed? According to his wife, Jennifer, Cullen was in recovery from addiction to painkillers, and he kept on track after going into rehab. But in the days before his disappearance, she noticed a massive shift in his behavior. 
Cullen had reported pain in his jaw and left arm and had gotten little sleep, which was very out of character for him. In fact, his family jokingly called him Mr. Dap due to his ability to outsleep everyone else. On the day of his disappearance, Jennifer noticed another bizarre shift in Cullen's behavior. She told USA Today that Cullen had slept for three to five hours that night and had turned down dinner. This was an odd behavior for a man who was known to sleep for long hours like a baby, and she also noticed that his eyes appeared beady. Cullen had also consumed several alcoholic drinks that day, but this was a vacation after all. At 8 p.m., Cullen donned his fishing gear and headed out on what would be his last ever trip. All this was taken into consideration by the coroner, and when Cullen's autopsy was performed, it revealed some troubling answers. According to the autopsy report, Cullen had been suffering from CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is common in those who frequently receive blows to the head, such as football players. This disorder degenerates the brain and causes memory loss, dementia, depression, changes in mood, and difficulty making decisions, along with a myriad of other things. Medical records indicated that he had only suffered one concussion during his freshman year and that the school dealt with the matter promptly and the incident was recorded. His family later stated that Cullen had probably suffered four or five more real serious concussions and dozens more smaller ones along the way. His brother had also jokingly called him a meathead during a speech at his wedding and said, he's lucky he found you because he's no longer getting into bar fights. Cullen also suffered from two herniated discs, which led to him being prescribed the prescription painkillers. The coroner also noted in the report that Cullen had a slightly enlarged heart and slightly cloudy lungs, and no trauma or marks to the body. Further going on to state that Cullen Finnerty's anxiety and paranoia in the woods the night of May 26th may have been exacerbated by an elevated level of painkillers and the CTE. Stephen Cole, the Kent County Chief Medical Examiner, would also later tell the press Finnerty became incapacitated before inhaling his own vomit and choking. While it appeared that the Finnertys finally had a conclusion, the Boston University Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy also made their own conclusions. Cullen's brain was sent to them for further testing, where they determined that the severity of CTE was moderate, and it's highly unlikely that disease alone led to his death. So then what happened to Cullen Finnerty that night? The medical examiner's office noted that the CTE and painkiller toxicity was present in Cullen, but no one has been able to provide the family with any concrete answers. The Boston University Center that studied Cullen's brain made a statement saying, CTE possibly affected his judgment, insight, and behavior, but there are other factors, including the use of medications prescribed by his doctor that most likely contributed to the circumstances surrounding his death. Unfortunately, because of the complexity of his medications and medical status, it is impossible to determine the specific combination of factors that led to his tragic death. So something happened to Cullen Finnerty in the wilderness that brisk May night, but what? Did he have a paranoid episode or was someone really out to get him? For now, it seems that the case is closed. That is until more evidence comes to light. Number two, Garrett Bardsley. 12-year-old Garrett Bardsley loved baseball and being in the great outdoors with his father. On August 20, 2004, Garrett and his father were on a Boy Scout camping trip in the Uinta Mountains in the Uinta Wasatch Cache National Forest. There were around seven adults and 18 children on the trip, and it promised to be an exciting outing for all. Children excitedly rushed into the forest where the Uinta Mountains are located and were eager to get going on their hike. After setting up camp and settling in, Garrett, his father, and the rest of the group made their way to Lake Cumberant One to do a spot of fishing. Armed with fishing rods, nets, and bait, the group happily walked down the 150 or so yard path that led from their campsite to the lake. During the fishing trip, Garrett got his shoes, socks, and pants wet and complained to his father that they made him uncomfortable. So, Garrett asked his dad if he could walk back to the camp to change his clothes. Garrett's father agreed, but this would be the last time that Garrett Bardsley was ever seen. His father shouted out directions to Garrett, reminding him which forks and directions to take to get to the campsite. According to one report, while Garrett was making his way back to the camp, his father heard someone shouting, Dad, but didn't investigate these shouts. Fifteen minutes had now passed since Garrett had made the 150-yard trek to the campsite, 
and he still had not returned. Worried, Garrett's father began searching the path and the campsite, thinking that his son had possibly taken a wrong turn. But there was no sign of him. This is when panic set in, and the gravity of the situation took hold of his father. After speaking to the scouts at the site, Garrett's father discovered that no one had seen him. He quickly put out an alert for his son, and the Summit County Sheriff's Office was called to the scene. The campsite that had once been filled with the laughter of scouts was now eerily quiet as volunteers and investigators began combing through the area, looking for any sign of the boy. In all, 200 volunteers and search and rescue teams from Cache County, Salt Lake County, Wasatch County, and Duchesne County joined the search for the missing 12-year-old boy. As word spread about his disappearance, horse units were even called in. Despite this huge collaborative effort, no sign of Garrett was discovered. In the days following Garrett's disappearance, only one clue was found. A soggy Nike sock, about a half mile from the campground and the lake. Garrett's mother confirmed to investigators that the sock belonged to her son. However, the Charlie Project interestingly notes, but one of the searchers claimed it was his own. With little evidence to work with, the Summit County Sheriff's Office concluded that it was unlikely that Garrett had been kidnapped and the search was called off nine days after he was last seen. His family continued to search for him, employing the help of volunteers and desperately hoping to find any trace of their son. Unfortunately, nothing has ever been found, and investigators believe that Garrett likely got lost on his way to or from the campsite and that he died from exposure. While investigators believe that he perished due to this exposure, this theory would be turned upside down in 2009. According to the park record, a woman came forward in 2009 claiming to have spotted Garrett in Nevada. In fact, she called this tip into the TV show America's Most Wanted, who then passed it on to the police. This anonymous woman claimed that she saw Garrett in a Smith store in the company of two men in July of 2009. It appears that this lead was followed up and CCTV footage was examined, but nothing else has come of this mysterious sighting since. Garrett Bardsley was last seen on August 20, 2004, near the Uinta Mountains in the Uinta Wasatch National Forest. He is described as a white male with light brown hair, hazel eyes, standing five foot tall and weighing 105 pounds. At the time of his disappearance, Garrett no longer had braces, which are often shown on missing posters. His hair was also longer, and he has a birthmark on his right forearm. When last seen, Garrett was wearing a black Quicksilver pullover, reversible Nike, sweat, reversible Nike sweatpants with one side being red and silky fabric with a black and white stripe, and the other side being black mesh with a red and white stripe, a white t-shirt, Nike ankle socks, and white Converse with black or navy stars on the side. Anyone with any information is urged to contact Lieutenant Alan Sidaway of the Summit County Sheriff's Office at 453-615-3600 and reference case 04L12342. Number 1. Jerika Binks 24-year-old Jerika Binks was on her way to getting her life back on track in late 2017, early 2018. Jerika had voluntarily moved into a sober living facility and was responding well to treatment. During her time at the facility, Jerika would take daily runs, sometimes running as far as 10 to 15 miles at once, and she had also taken up self-defense classes in order to defend herself should the occasion arise. We all know that both exercise and getting outdoors is great for your health and mental well-being, and no doubt employees at the facility likely encouraged Jerika to channel her energy into something like running. Sadly, however, Jerika's running routine would end in tragedy with her disappearance and eventual demise. February 18th, 2018 started normally. Jerika donned her running gear and told her roommate that she was going for her usual run. The two said their goodbyes and Jerika left the treatment center. Her route was confirmed when trail cameras captured her running down through the American Fork Canyon in the Uinta Wasatch Cache National Park. More specifically, cameras captured her running down the Tempanogos Cave Trail with her water bottle, phone, and earbuds. After that, the trail goes cold. As Jerika lived in a sober living facility, the alarm was raised very quickly when she failed to return home that night and Jerika's mother was immediately contacted. While the facility she lived at did act swiftly regarding her disappearance, it appears that the police did not. 
Jerika's mother reported her daughter missing to the police, but the missing person report had been filed in the wrong district, causing huge delays in the investigation. It wasn't until eight days after Jerika had been last seen that the police finally launched a full investigation and search for her. Investigators began to trace her last steps and noted that Minx had gone off the proper trail and continued her run into the afternoon in an area of the park that was closed for winter. Search and rescue crews, police departments, and volunteers scoured the area, looking for Jerika, doing whatever they could despite the wet and windy conditions. At some point during the search, snow began to fall, which made it difficult to traverse and the roads became blocked. Despite the conditions, volunteers and personnel turned up every day in good spirits, determined to bring peace and justice to Jerika's family. But there was just no sign of her. Eventually, the search was called off, but the investigation into her disappearance continued. According to photographer Brittany Lizenby, who was on the trail on February 18th, she had heard gunshots in the area. She also allegedly came across a campsite that looked as though someone had set it up for a ritual complete with sharpened sticks arranged in a deliberate way. The police were unable to find any connections between the strange camp and Jerika's disappearance, however, and it continues to be an odd tidbit in her case. On April 14, 2019, 14 months after Jerika had disappeared, a shocking discovery was made by a hiker making their way through a rocky ravine under the Swinging Bridge picnic area in the National Park. The hiker himself described the terrain as very difficult to get up. It's not a trail where people commonly go hiking. This location was where Jerika's body was discovered. The location where Jerika's body was discovered has also been described as halfway up a steep ravine, away from any trails or man-made structures, roughly a mile northwest of the Swinging Bridge picnic area, and half a mile from the trailhead where Jerika was last seen. Authorities were alerted to the find, and by April 17, 2019, they confirmed that the remains belonged to the missing Jerika Binks. The remains were skeletal, and it appears that a cause of death has not been confirmed, although it is believed to have been accidental. According to reports, Jerika had suffered a serious break to both bones in the lower part of one of her legs, although investigators cannot be sure how these injuries were obtained. Since the discovery of her remains in 2019, there's been little movement in the case, with authorities labeling it as an accident, death by misadventure. But how did Eureka end up halfway up a steep ravine? Did she fall or did someone put her there? Hopefully, one day we'll have answers. Well, friends, there you have it. What do you think of these strange National Park disappearances? I look forward to hearing your comments, but please keep it friendly and respectful. If you'd like to see more videos like this, check out the playlist that we have on our channel. These playlists showcase our best content and videos that many of you may have never seen before. So check them out, see what you missed out on. Till we meet again, be good to yourselves and each other. Stay safe out there. As for me, I'll see you a little farther on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time.